good evening and welcome to everyone in this room and in all the rooms uh, across the world watching online. I'm Molly Rosenberg, I'm Director of the Royal Society of Literature, and I'm so pleased that we're joined by so many of you tonight for this Literature Matters RSL 200 event with our partners here at the British Library and with the Living Knowledge Network. Those attending in person today uh, will have all had a copy of the bumper bicentenary edition of our RSL Review magazine. Here you can read more about some of the work we've introduced uh, for our RSL 200 five-year festival and some of the previous speakers we've had uh, as part of this event series. If you'd like to learn more about the RSL and the work we do, please sign up to our newsletter. You'll be the first to hear about some very special events we have coming up, uh, including the next in our RSL 200 events. But before that, Tonight we have the pleasure of being in the company of RSL fellow Andrew O'Hagan and his great friend, the actor Gillian Anderson. You may all know. get to the end of my introduction and then you can that. Right. in this extra special discussion Gillian and Andrew will study some of their favorite literary characters uh, and explore why literature matters so much to them what makes Miss Havisham who Gillian played in Great Expectations distinct from Wallace Simpson who she brought to life in any human heart how does it feel to give physical form to words on a page leading the discussion this evening is Andrew O'Hagan Andrew was born in Glasgow and grew up in Ayrshire. He has three times been nominated for the Booker Prize, was voted one of Granter's Best of Young British Novelists in 2003, and has won the Glenn Fiddick Brighter of the Year Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Award, and the E.M. Forster Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He is editor-at-large of the London Review of Books and is contributor to Esquire, the New York Review of Books, and The New Yorker. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, I'll say it again, uh, and has served on its governing council. I'm very pleased to pass over to Andrew now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. It's so wonderful to see all your faces tonight. It was Charles Dickens who said, I have been in the theatrical profession all my life as a writer. My wife, he said, is in the theatrical profession. My children are in it. My dog has been on stage since it was a puppy, and my pony, my chase pony, also goes on, he said. He took it for granted that the relationship between literature and acting was fundamental in our culture. So it's a joy to be under the auspices of the Royal Society of Literature, the most interesting, the most searching of our institutions uh, representing literature, and to be able to talk to to my mind, the most interesting actor of her generation, Gillian Anderson. Please give it up for her. She's here tonight. <laughs> now, I'm not going to waste any of our time on biography tonight. It would take me 15 minutes, at least, possibly half an hour, to go through even a summary of what uh, Gillian has achieved as an actor. Um, you all know her story, um, born in Chicago. Um, she's lived in London for a long time and she has traveled the world representing this incredible panoply of characters over the course of her career. Women with strength, mystery, willpower, secret heart and expansive motivation. I mean, I want to get right into it uh, with you, Gillian. I mean, right at the beginning of what we understand to be her career at the in the X-Files, you were there doing something which we hadn't quite seen before in my submission, which is to show a sidekick who wasn't a sidekick. That's to say mm -hmm. a female agent who didn't, um, as it were, show herself to be the hysterical or difficult one in that partnership, but in fact to be the rational, scientific one. Mm -hmm. David Duchovny's character was the more romantic, extraterrestrial believing, irrational character. Mm -hmm. And if you look back at the history of sci-fi television. We hadn't seen that before. Mm. Were you conscious right from the beginning that this was a female character that was quite new to television? No, 
<laughs> you just found that? I don't, no, no, no. I, I don't think I was conscious of anything at the time. Um, I think that I was, I was conscious that I was potentially going to have a job. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even, I, I wasn't even conscious that the job, were I to get the job, um, uh, would, would tie me to something for, you know, a, a very long time. But something obviously happened over those 10, 11 seasons where, in fact, from season nine, you're the central force in the drama, your character, so Agent Scully becomes, if you like, the central consciousness in that. In that yeah, part. I mean, I think it happened, it happened um, uh, earlier on, it happened during the course of the series. And, and certainly I would say that the, the creator, Chris Carter, had, um, you know, that that was part of his plan, in a sense, his, his mastermind. But it was, it was really, um, it was really the duo of them, I have to say, uh, moving forward. The, the dynamic between the two of them had never really been seen before. You know, maybe the Thin Man films or something, sure. but there was something very uh, unique about that as well. But her um, her trajectory was really, as much as anything, the trajectory of, of me growing up in front of the camera and um, being completely naive and just showing up in survival mode and um, and trying to, you know, do what I was being asked to do on a daily basis. And anything that came above and beyond that, um, it, it was almost a gift from, from the writer in that he allowed the audience to project yeah. onto her. Yeah. One, we'd never seen anything like her before. Two, she was unique, you know, even in and of herself. But she was also something that could be projected upon by people. Yes. But, mm. And we see it right up to the, the, the present day with Jean Melbourne, is that you, you're never, you never allow yourself as a performer, I suggest, to become anybody's, any male fantasist's, you know, version of a woman. You find the strength somehow in the character. I mean, of course, I can't suggest to you that you've always been planning to play these roles, because that's not how it works in anybody's career, not for a writer or for a, for a performer, but there's something in your DNA, I suggest, that attracts you to women who absolutely define themselves, not against male definitions mm. of who she should be, but find something in herself, a power or a direction that comes from the character herself. I mean, it's one, the comic engine mm. in Jean Melbourne mm. is that, it's almost a reversal of what you expect a parent to be like in that situation. Yeah, and no, no, and again, I, I'd have to say, you know, to, to be fair, that that was very much, it, it is in the writing in in, uh, in Sex Ed, very much uh, Laurie's um, uh, writing in terms of, of where Jean sits in relation to the men in her life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would say the, the, the thing that I brought to her was actually more more neurosis than was even on the page <laughs> because it was important to me that you know Laurie not being a woman of a certain age that that um, that that we get to see a, a woman who is properly you know struggling and having to contend with all aspects of what being a a uh, a woman in her fifties, a woman, a single mother, and um, and negotiating herself as much as she is the relationship with her kids and trying to maintain, you know, uh, an awakened sexual existence and also her career. And I think um, I think that's where we get to see both her weaknesses and her strengths are in in contending with herself and and both her failings and her, you know, successes in those relationships. Did you feel that when sex education was offered to you, did you feel it was a risk for you? I mean, are you conscious that you've got a persona as an actor in the way that actors traditionally, strong actors do? We think we know who Clark Gable is. We think we know who, yeah. you know, Rita Hayworth is. In a sense, are you, are you conscious yourself? Are you able to say that some of the roles you're accepting run counter to who no, no, I, I would say the only risk that I saw with Jean was was for my 
two teenage boys. <laughs> <laughs> and whether having a mother who was playing a character like this um, was going to seriously damage them psychologically, <laughs> uh, but also, uh, you know, damage them at school. You know, one, were it not to be successful, and then mo her, their mom would be on this creepy failing show on Netflix, <laughs> you know, or if it was successful, you know, having to contend with that. And uh, so I think that that was really my only concern. I, I didn't get it at first. Mm. I, I, I didn't get, uh, I have a tendency to appreciate much more uh, uh, subtle, ironic humor. And, and it was so broad that at first I thought, you know, this is, this isn't for me, and and no, nobody's gonna like this, mm. and and so I, you know, I tossed it in the bin. But um, I, I'm very glad I was convinced to pull it out, and and I mean, take a risk in a sense of, uh, you know, for for all the things that I might have been afraid of, but also comedy. You mm. know, um, e even if what one as an actor I I have found, if it's not. It's very, very different acting comedy as it is drama. And I, it's See actually, I, mean, I find way. it harder. Um, and it, it may just be, it may just be me and not having had that much experience of it over my career. Uh, but it, uh, I find that w one has to be unbelievably specific. Mm -hmm. And very often, you can tell your body how to do. You know, you can you can attempt to do something comedically, mm -hmm. and very often it can just not land. Yeah. It can just not work. Yeah. You can be yeah. trying everything, yeah. and yet it doesn't quite. Or it's not. There's something that's not. And I know that you know, having worked with. Um... <laughs> Give us a clue. We'll work it out between Johnny us. Johnny English. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Rowan Atkinson. I'm so glad you're Having here. Having worked with Rowan Atkinson, I can say, you know, he's... I, I experience him, and he's... I don't know whether he speaks about this, but I'll speak about it for him. Um, <laughs> but he is tort he's tortured by that specificity, yeah. you know, and... and uh, well, to take after take after take, trying to, you know... And, and I could very easily fall down that. Well, he said it himself fault. that that strange necessity for expression and restraint mm. that exists in the mm. comic actor going all the way back. I mean, it's something I would suggest. I mean, you can do all the training you like and there's a lot of technique there, but there must be something instinctive. I mean, you're quite funny in yourself, so you must be able to mine that. You, you seem to enjoy playing this part. I do, I do. I do, I have a weird thing of, of being, you know, like, way too serious that it's inappropriate and 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 too goofy for my own good you know uh somebody called me on it recently i was working with an actor that i'd never worked with before and he completely he said you you never know what you're going to get with you mm. I, I was dumbstruck and then i thought he's fucking right yeah <laughs> he's really he is and i yeah. don't i um Anyway, I digress, sorry. That's a source of it. <laughs> you know, so that, um, ladies and gentlemen, is our overture. Let me, tell you how this, <laughs> let me tell you how this is going to work. We're going to look at seven characters. This evening's all about character, <laughs> specifically because um, literature, the Royal Society of Literature is our host this evening, is often about the creation, the maintenance, the investigation of character. So it seemed to us a great idea to bring in somebody who has the experience and the magnitude of talent that, that, that Gillian has. And we're going to look at seven. We've already mentioned some of them, but we're going to look at Scully from The X-Files, Lily Bart from A House of Murph, Stella Gibson from The Fall, Margaret Thatcher from The Crown, feel free to boo. <laughs> Blanche Dubois from A Streetcar Named Desire. Jean Milburn, who we've mentioned, and if of time, Eleanor Roosevelt, who Gillian has just played in a forthcoming, I mean, April, I think, forthcoming, yeah. TV series co-starring Viola Davis and Dakota Fanning. Now, the, we, we did start with... And Michelle Pfeiffer. Oh, yeah, Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, <laughs> we've mentioned the X-Files. The thing, before moving uh, away from that, I just want to ask you about 
the construction of character in that and how important, because I know you started to direct on the show. Mm. And did you feel that, I'm just interested for a minute in this relationship between performing and directing. Yeah. And did you feel that directing was a way of um, going further with the character or was it to do with the whole picture? No, I th you know, and I, I, I've, I've wondered about this quite a lot, which is that for some reason while I was working, and there were certain, there are certain roles that I take on where I feel like I want to get involved in the process of expanding and making it uh, 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 expanding. For some reason, with Scully, and I don't, uh, I had, I, I wasn't, I wasn't involved in that, and mm. I, I think I was partly. Uh, it, it was so clear who she was. I was, I was being reminded all the time who she was, and I didn't get involved in that. Whereas I think David very much got involved in his trajectory and wanted to do certain things or yep. wanted to see the character go. And I kind of left that to the writers, possibly a bit too much. Um, and and so I didn't really have that experience um, on that show. Um, and so that that was really all, everything that transpired was all was all them. And, yep. and, and it wasn't until later in my career that I realized that I might have a voice and yeah. I might be able to contribute, and I might be listened to yeah. from time to time. I mean, being listened to seems to me to be one of the driving engines. I mean, as as a as a audience member looking at the work. I mean, when you look at Lily Bart in A House of Mouth, I mean, an absolutely beautiful film. Uh, still, it's dating so well. I watched it again this week, and you see, this is really a it's really a look at sexual, the sexual mores of women in a world of corrupt men. Mm. That these men can make money for each other and help each other out and be uh, an aid to each other in Wall Street. But when Lily does it, she also has to have sex with them. Mm. And if she doesn't, then, you know, I mean, it's incredibly forward thinking and political, that film, it seems to me. There's a beautiful moment where she turns down the proposal of marriage, Mr. Rosdale, mm. and as she turns away, you, ma you manage to do disgust on your face without a single word being said. I remember looking at that just in terms of character and thinking, how do you do that? How do you manage to <laughs> give the inner life of a character outward expression? I mean, can you, can you address that? I mean, even in relation to that part, how, tell us about the journey with that character. Well, I do, I, I do know that I have found that I cannot use real life, not, not direct real life stuff for, my, for internal lives of characters. And I very, I, you know, sadly and ironically, very often when I've been in the midst of playing a role, something in my life on the outside has mirrored it in one way or another yes. simultaneously, which is uh, really unfortunate. Um, but it's, it makes it then even harder to use it as a tool to get to a, a, a place or a choice. Um, with Lily Bice, you know, it's a very long time ago. I do know that I was terrified. I do know Why? that this was the first, well, because it was the first time I, I had been a fan of Terence Davies. He was, you know, he's a, quite an obscure director mm -hmm. and uh, it was an art house film and I happened to know his work and and was slightly obsessed with his work and so I was very excited to work with him and uh, flattered to have been given the job and I felt like I was proving what I had an opportunity in a, a platform to prove that I could do something diff other than Scully yeah and um, you know at that point the X-Files had become so big and um, is that and a worry Gillian the idea that wh at whatever point in your career mm -hmm for any actor, especially women, I suggest to you, that they'll be pigeonholed and restricted in the roles that they're allowed to play, that a big successful TV actress is going to oh, be yeah. stuck. Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's less so now than it has been in mm. the past. And it's also less so in the UK than it is it was in the US. I mean, I've, I've spoken about this before and it's also one of the reasons why I chose to move to the UK instead of staying in the States was that for a very long time, actresses, have been uh, allowed to move between theatre, mm. film, and television effortlessly and not judged for doing TV and not punished for going back to do theatre. Um, and so I, I wanted a bit of that in my career. Mm. And, um, and by being here, I've been able to have that. And, and since then, 
it's also become more acceptable in the States to, to do, you know, uh, to have careers similar to that. For and in terms of characterization, mm -hmm. could you just give us a minute on this question of the relationship in terms of formation of character between a performer and a director? Because there you are with Terence Davis. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only art house, but a director of great stillness and concentration who'll let the cat camera linger as he does uh, in the House of Mouth on a, on a stream for a good few minutes. Well, there was a, there was an, in Long Day Closes, I remember being in college and seeing Long Day Closes in some art house uh, theater, movie theater. And he had, uh, the, the camera was still on a carpet with a, a, a light reflection coming in through the window and an image. And he, I don't know how long that, camera remained mm -hmm. on that carpet, but I wept. It's still on there. Yeah. <laughs> I was weeping this. He really does have the ability to express emotion, transition uh, with, and I think I think there are a few directors that do this. Andre Arnold does this yeah. really well, and it's quite rare yeah. to, to be Lynn able Ramsey, to Lynn Ramsey, just stay, letting the camera sit. Letting the camera, but also knowing where to put it. Yeah. I've thought about that with Andrea's work, that a, a diff, uh, under another director's hand, a camera for a long time on a windowsill would make you switch the channel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but for some reason, Andrea knows the sweet spot of where to, to put the camera that makes you riveted and, and you understand what she's saying. You're understanding the transition that oh, she's completely. trying to invoke. But that must be quite odd from the actor's point of mm. view, given that you don't necessarily know. No, and you can't trust it. And the amount well, of times that the I've part, thought, you know? this director I'm working with is genius. I mean, this is amazing, amazing, amazing. And then, <laughs> and then it's shite. And then it's shite. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a wee look at uh, Stella Gibson in the fall. Yep. I mean, that was, uh, to many of us, um, I love the whooping. <laughs> it's just great. Um, let's talk about the writing there first, because, I mean, again, we could do an hour on this alone, mm. where it suddenly this character arrives on screen, on the small screen in this case, who seems fully formed. Mm. She seems to have a huge hinterland unspoken, a huge background, a depth of experience, which you brought in. You just walked in with it, it seemed to us. Mm. Now, I'm not gonna ask you how you do that, although I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Yeah, I mean, it's the most impossible thing to, to get to, but what I want to know is, at the script stage, did you look at that and say, I can find her? I, I mean, uh, to me, this is a, a constant example of, of the, the difference between uh, good writing and not so good writing. And I, I don't even know how to describe it. I, you know, it's, it's really hard to put into words. Um, I do know that when I looked at the fall scripts that I, 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 I'd read so many scripts up until that point where it, it just, you know, you, you, as a reader, let alone as an audience member, you're force-fed characters and motivation and emotion. And his scripts, Alan Cubitt's scripts, are so spare, and yet I got everything about her. Mm -hmm. I, I remember being on page six and having thought before, you know, being told this was a series, I don't want to do any more series, I'm not going to do anything, you know. I, I'd, you know, and then page six, I, I was Ripped. in. I, I could have, you know... Um, and I can't tell you, and I, I'd since gone on to do something else to kind of create something myself where I, um, or maybe it was before that, but the, the juxtaposition of what I, I, what else can be out there and his script was so, uh, was such a huge chasm between mm. the two, and yet... I don't know how to put it into words. I don't know how to give notes to a writer who's not getting there or who doesn't understand yeah. it or whatever to say, you know, you just, I end up just It's as saying, if you understood what an actor can do. Yeah. He left you the space to do it. Yeah, yes, you know. but also somehow it embodies, and I've only been able to speak about it in terms of it being alchemic, mm. that it almost felt like like she was on the page yeah. in as few words as it, you know, it took to, to have her on the page, but it was almost like a, but also he really works on his, you know, he'll spend a year or two, you know, manifesting in his head 
who this is. And I think it's the same with an artist. I think mm. it's the same with a, with a Clemente or with a, a Bryce Marden where they work on a single painting for, an, for a year and it's when they're done, it's one color. <laughs> yeah. It is one color, and yet, or with Rothko, yeah. you stand in front of it and again you go, and again, yeah. oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> and yet it's, the, it's what is, and it's it was the same with his writing. It's undeclared depths that are just embedded, yeah. they're just there. Yes. There's a wonderful moment, just a home in one thing in the fall. It's a wonderful moment where Stella does something without any explanation, without any indication um, it's an expression of her inner psychology and desire. Mm. She takes an attractive young man back to her hotel mm. room, fucks him, and then doesn't use his phone number. Mm. Men have been doing that on film for years, mm. but women weren't allowed to do that. Yeah. You know, she I mean, has the amount of time, the amount of times in all of the press that I did for the whole three seasons, within the first three questions from a journalist, it was about that. Because they couldn't handle it. In 2019, yeah. or whatever it would have been, in season yeah. three. It was remarkable. Well, yeah. and I, I found that I found that as uh, as fascinating as anything else I wanted to talk about. People couldn't about, get over it. They couldn't get over it. You know that this intelligent, sexy woman takes a man, has a brilliant moment of sex, and it says, "Right, that's you. Fuck yeah. off." Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. It's really good. As far as you know, talk about it. That's how liberation works, ladies and gentlemen. We're racing on because we've got a lot to get through. Yeah. Blanche Dubois. Now. One of the things that I think we, I must ask you is that when it comes to character is the question of tradition. Mm. Because you, some roles, it's not true of Stella, it's not true of a brand newly minted character that mm. you've made before her eyes, but what about a character who's been minted long mm. ago and who has been played famously, as Blanche was, of course, um, on screen and on stage many times? Mm. What's your relationship with that? Do you ignore it in your formation of the character or do you draw it in? I mean, this has happened to you a few times, famously, more recently, uh, in All About Eve. Mm. I remember talking to you at the time and you said, I'm not taking any interest in Betty Davis's yeah. performance, famous performance as Margot Channing. Yeah. You had to find it yourself. Can you just talk us through that? Well, I, I mean, exactly right. And, and part of it is, is fear of, uh, of some part of my brain mimicking something. Yeah or not starting from, uh, from a clean slate and somehow taking on things that I don't necessarily agree with once I have then done my own work on it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, having worked with Benedict Andrews, who was the director of Streetcar, you know, I, I found working with him uh, so rewarding and such an amazing experience for this, particularly for this, for this play, which I'd been wanting to do for no less than 30 years. And, you know, when we got into the rehearsal space, we really, really started from, from scratch. And um, <laughs> uh, uh, we started from scratch and we dug, we dug such a deep hole in getting into all the different layers of, of uh, Williams's text. Can and, I just interrupt and ask you yeah. why? you wanted for 30 years to play that particular character? I don't know. See, I, I, I did, I did the, the, a monologue from it for an audition. But I didn't remember that until I spoke in an interview about the fact that I'd always wanted to play Blanche Dubois. And my mom sent me an email and said, because you did an interview for such and such for this thing when you were a teenager. And I'd completely forgotten. But... And it's again, it's a, it, see, it's almost like it might be a little bit along the lines of a string theory, which is that, oh, that you know, that, that it's already happened mm -hmm. in a way, something that is incredibly profound in your life. And so to what degree are we moving towards that end because it already exists? Yeah. And I know I, I might sound a little bit... <laughs> A little bit mad at the minute, but um, and, and to what degree are we are, are we manifesting out of uh, out of thin air? Yeah. Because it did feel, I can't tell you why. I couldn't tell. Because it's already but there. Was there. I mean, the it's language there. is there. She's there as but a character. But I already identified as a sixteen-year-old young lady. Yeah. I already identified with Blanche, and I knew that she lived inside me. But why? Well, I could see it at the time, and it seemed, if you don't mind the suggestion, yeah. at some level. 
not in a crudely autobiographical way necessarily, but at some level, intensely personal. You and I made a short film yeah. uh, based on, it was a prequel to the play actually, which you directed. Uh, uh, after we did the after play. After the play. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that, that piece, that film, beautiful, uh, I think, was, showed a heavy investment on your part in this sort of the, the deep history of the character, mm. in the brokenness, going way back, going, yeah. as it were, before the events yeah. in the play. You were interested in the mess, the brokenness. And it seemed to me, as, as I watched you direct it, uh, and play it, of course, that there was something in it about her vulnerability which just was a touchstone for you, somehow. Yes, yes. Um, is that where it is? Um, I, but also the, the degree to her, 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 you know, she's barreling, she's barreling forward, you know, full speed ahead as self-destruction. Yes. At a brick wall. At the same time that there's also part of her that knows that she's heading in that direction and she wants to be saved. Yeah. You know, she's not necessarily able or willing to save herself mm -hmm. and to do what it takes to pull herself, uh, you know, off of that train. But um, but she knows that that there's a chance that somebody else, uh, you know. It was pretty mesmerizing that because I mean, she, what she had was in her suffering, mm. she had incredible strength and spirit. You know, desperate for survival, leaning into survival, but somehow falling short. Yeah, and I, I, that tension is 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 fascinating, and somehow that tension exists inside me, and I feel like it almost still does, you know, exist inside me, even though I feel like more than Blanche, I win at the end of the day. I, mm. You know, so far I I, I keep winning, mm. um, and uh, and jumping off the train. Um, uh, but there is something definitely uh, about about that. Could you introduce us to that space, though, Gillian? Yeah. It's the hardest thing to talk about yeah. in a way, but there's Tennessee William. Yeah. He's written a classic. It's an accepted classic. We know the words. We all quote them. It seems set in concrete. And then you come in and say, no, no, it's not set in concrete. It's liquid. I'm going to insert myself. These are the lines. This is the situation. The director and the company and I are going to go somewhere with this. Can you just describe that? I think that's that the creation? director, though. I think that's the director. I think before, you know, that that's another thing that happens in in starting from a clean slate, at least in my experience, is is what that allows you is if you're with a good director, which Benedict was, that you can be led to those places. Yeah. And I had no idea where we were headed. I had no idea how she was going to end up uh, uh, sitting in that world, how it was going to sit in relation to this revolving stage that we were on or any of it. And he, you know, slowly, slowly, you know, pulled at all of us and guided us at the same time towards who we became as these characters. And and I couldn't have, you know, it, it could have been different under a director, a, a different director's hand. I don't know. I don't know if, if, if that was the Blanche that was always inside me, mm -hmm. and that's how she would have, uh, I would have manifested her, no matter who the director was. I don't know. As a side issue, during that process you describe of being led by a director towards mm. that, that that clarity, have you ever thought in the middle of that journey, this isn't working. This director's wrong. Not, certainly not with Blanche. No, no, I mean uh, yeah. the other parts uh, throughout your career. I, I've certainly thought he, she doesn't know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought that meant, I thought, And why? how does a character creation survive? What am I doing here? Why yeah. did I say yes? <laughs> oh, my God. I thought, I thought, you start ringing people. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but is that yeah. is, is that something that you have to learn to cope with as an actor? Yeah. You have an idea of a character, you're on this track now. You've never walked off of a production as far as I understand, have you? No, it's not necessarily so much that. It's about because I'm I I I'm happy to be led. And and very often I show up. I mean, I just did a, a film in Pittsburgh and you know, I mean sometimes I know exact I mean with with with, with historical uh, uh, characters, obviously, you know what you want 
yourself to be like as them as the final, you know. Uh, but but, and you have to trust yourself, like with Thatcher, you have to trust yourself that at the point that you've got all the bits on and the hair and the clothes and the everything and that, you know, that it's all going to come together, that the walk and the movements and the voice and the everything that it's going to, you know, but... Uh, uh, and then there's the version where, which I just did, which is where I don't get quite so specific. I mean, that had to be so specific, Thatcher. Mm -hmm. And always something I just did where kind of a loony character, not particularly well drawn out in the script, went knowing what she was going to look like because I'd done a lot of fittings, no clue who she was, but, but had to trust and chose to trust other than some things that I've made up in my head that I was going to wait until actually I was kind of there on set with them to see how yeah. she turned up, Yeah. you know? And and sometimes that happens. And, mm. and you know, fortunately, I think it went all right in the end. Oh, totally. Um, I mean, one of the th things we're obsessed uh, with, obviously, uh, the RSL is text, yeah. writing, how yeah. much of it is embedded in the art of literature. Oh, well, obviously I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. I mean, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you a question. Well, that, I mean, yeah. I, it's just really a prompt. I know that you care yeah. about this because perhaps of all the actors that I know and certainly uh, among your uh, generation, you're actually properly engaged with the question of literary character. Mm. You played Lady Deadlock. We talked mm. about Lily Bart. You've got a relationship with text yeah. and with, as it were, arriving at a character out of a famous text. Can you just... Give us yeah, a I mean, I know with Lily Bart that, that um, you know, I really, really studied the novel. Um, and, uh, and same for Bleak House, because there's only so much that, that a screenplay can hold. Mm -hmm. And particularly with something that is not multi-series, but a, a single film like House of Mirth. You know, there's going to be so many things that are, are uh, that the film is not going to be able to encompass that are yeah. in the book. Yeah. And... On the one hand, you have to be able to, to immerse yourself in the novel, but let go enough that you don't then ring the director every five minutes and say, why isn't this bit in it? And why isn't that bit? And yeah. I think my character would do this. And you know, and same with The Crown. You know, my, working on The Crown is very much, it's not a biopic about the prime ministers. Mm -hmm. You know, it is about the queen and about the crown and everything is through that lens. And mm -hmm. so so you can do all this research and work, you know, your your buns off, but the 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 parameters of what you're working within are only those six ep six episodes, are only those slices of her life, mm -hmm. you know, and so even though you may have immersed yourself entirely in uh, you know the the um, her her dealings with unions or it, with the IRA or with whatever it yeah. might have been, you don't get to go there. <laughs> you know, you don't really. No, but get you to... seem to like to absorb the history or the kind of societal you have pressure. To, I, I feel. I mean, for me, I feel like if I if I didn't do that, even though it's not touched on within the text of the screenplay mm. that it would be, th I would feel like one, I'm doing the character a disservice, the human being a disservice, but also that that it, the character would feel thin. Even in just doing the research and filling I in remember. all that stuff yes. is, the, is the Rothko. That was the, that was the, the layers. Yeah. I remember this specifically. I mean, it wasn't a huge part, but it was a very important part in the adaptation of War and Peace. Mm. Or Madame Scherer, mm. you know, the Salon East Team, there she was at the top of the show. It's not like you wanted to study the Napoleonic War, but you needed, I remember us having a mm. conversation on the phone, where you needed to understand what the historical pressure in that room was. And you just found that it didn't come into the script. Mm. It wasn't something she said, it was something she was mm. at some level. Yep. Just another layer. But let's get to Thatcher because it's one of our famous seven uh, characters. And of course, um, We've been talking about text a lot, as, as seems right, but with Thatcher, what we must discuss is the physicality of the acting. Mm. That suddenly you were doing something with your mouth, doing something with your head, mm. leaning into people in a different way. I'd never seen anything like that from you before. Mm. Of course, there's, there's the look alike aspect and there's the big hair and all the rest of it. But more importantly, you did something to your physical being in that part. You dropped your voice. Can you just tell us how you found all that? Because it wasn't obvious that you would. It must have been tough. 
Uh, yeah, it wasn't obvious that I would. And I think that that is one of the things that is the, the scariest thing. And it's similar with, with Eleanor Roosevelt, which is, uh, you know, but, but before, again, I mean, I guess that's the same with all of them, whether they are historical characters, literary characters, or, or, or you know, or brand new uh, uh, contemporary characters, which is that in order to say yes to something, I have to be know that it already exists inside me. There's no point in in going searching for it because it, it you know. And so, given that, given that, when I asked myself that question, could I be you know do do, do I think I could play Thatcher? For whatever reason, I thought that I could. And so then it's about then it's about you know knowing that we're not going to use prosthetics knowing that um, that there's a lot of differences between her and I. What are the, the th aside from, aside from the givens, which mm. are that you're gonna have the helmet mm -hmm. uh, and you're gonna have a, you know, a, a bodysuit to mm. make my girth a little bit bigger and, and be uh, just the shoes yeah. and knowing that I'm going to uh, study her mannerisms and her walk and et cetera, et cetera, knowing that I'm going to study the voice to the best of my ability and find a place where it exists uh, somewhere between her voice and my voice so it doesn't sound too over the top or too unreal or whatever. Then there is the... the, the You know, ha, ha, how to sit inside of her so that when I'm inside, because mm. it's one thing to look afterwards and go, oh, yeah, you look like her, or that's her profile, or whatever, but to actually feel like her from the inside, that you are embodying that. Well, that's the mountain to climb, I suggest to you, because mm. in a way, the way I'd put it to you is, mm. how do you be her morally? Because, <laughs> you know... <laughs> That's, that's the challenge, right? <laughs> Hugely divisive figure. You've got to play it as a human being. That's not, yeah. This isn't a question about do you agree with yeah. her politics or not. We no, don't, no, that's, no, no, it's not. This is somewhere else where it's, yeah. how do you take on the moral being yeah. of a character who yeah. some people think is despicable yeah. morally and other people think was well, great? It's, it's the same thing. You, you have to, you know, when Forrest Whitaker played Idi Amin, yeah. he actually got to a place where he absolutely thought that he was that that Edie was doing the right you know, <laughs> that he believed that Edie Amin was you know was that's was, worrying was I know he is worrying and and I don't think you necessarily need to go that distance but you do need to get to a place where you understand why they are making the choices that they're making mm -hmm. you understand it based on what you now know of their childhood mm -hmm. of their upbringing of their relationship with their partner of their you know you know, growing up in Grantham and having a father who was an alderman and all, all the bits yeah. that made up who she was being, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, Methodist and hugely impactful mm -hmm. on the decisions that she made as a politician uh, and, and how the family worked, you know. Inserting yourself and understanding what makes somebody tick is the first step towards yeah. understanding how they then get to make those choices, so that you can you can you can play that scene, mm -hmm. making those choices within the scene, and and it feels it feels genuine. It feels like like you are embodying. Well, it was lovely to watch you and Olivia Coleman in those scenes because there there's two extremely powerful individuals, mm. both of them regal, in different ways, mm. and there's a kind of struggle going on as to who is the more powerful, who is the more correct. Of course, you can see in the performance as I think, I mean, it's a judgment, I guess, you and Pete and the whole, um, uh, the whole crew had to make about how, how, are we going to, how are we going to make her look? Because in some, some of those scenes, she's working against her own best interest. Yeah. You can see that she's fucking it up. Yeah. She's not popular with the yeah, queen yeah. in those scenes. And therefore yeah. the audience too might be like... Well, she didn't care. She, she, she didn't care. She, she knew she was right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she would have said. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And did you ever at any point think, oh, Christ, um, I'm playing somebody who in everyday life 
I might have objected to, or does that not come into it? It doesn't come into it. Can't do? No. Because mm -mm. that would be a bar to playing. Yeah, I mean, I know, I, I'm very keen to play a murderer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I've never been really given, no, have I? I? I don't believe I've ever murdered anybody. <laughs> the night is young. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing later? No, I'm sorry, always ready for um, killing. <laughs> uh, you know, you have to give yourself a, you just, you have to. So Eleanor Roosevelt, mm. I mean, did that present a I different I mean, that was some, that's something entirely different because yeah. you can say all that, but I just, you know, one doesn't have to fall in love with her. I completely fell in love with Eleanor. I didn't realize, I knew she was an extraordinary woman, but I had no idea she was as extraordinary a woman as she was. And so it was just, I mean, just the delight in doing that research. And I mean, we're getting a bit of a, an acting masterclass from you. And I, I'm moved to ask you, what are the things about Roosevelt that, you, that gave you a clue how to do her, how to find this extraordinary woman? Other than the lines that are there in the script, obviously. Yeah. Um, you know, again, it's about, to me, it, it's, about, it's about the research. It's about going back to childhood. It's about understanding, uh, you know, the thing about Eleanor that, um, you know, she was, she, she, her self-esteem was unbelievably low for the majority, mm. I mean, for her entire life. You know, she was raised... Essentially, by her grandmother, she lost her, her mother and then her father when she was eight and ten. She was sent off to a very mean grandmother, raised and then sent away to go to school. And um, actually sent to the UK to go to school that was run by a, a French woman who essentially kind of saved her life and, and taught her... Uh, it taught her the kind of woman that she could be, you know, and, and she became that woman. But... Um, Sorry, I'm so in love with her. Uh, so, um, um, Is it hard but, sometimes to leave a character behind? No, it's more. You know, she she had she just had tragedy after tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, and her mother used to tell her from a very young age that she was ugly. Mm. And the reason why she was going to send her somewhere to be uh, well-educated is because she was never going to be able to use her looks. Mm -hmm. And so she had to use her mind. And um, she called her granny. Her mom called her. You know, those kinds of things inform uh, a character. Mm. And, and, you know, when you watch Eleanor later in life, even when she would give speeches in front of... The United Nations, which she helped to, uh, you know, to found, <laughs> in a sense, um, she's tentative. Her voice is tentative. She's not, she's, she's always referring to notes. She's, her voice is very high pitched and it's broken and she pauses a lot and she says, um, and she, you know, all those things that you think that that strong, powerful uh, women are ha have a certain d degree of perfection to their, 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 their when they deliver and they give speech. Mm. you know she's a perfect example of of how y you can be afraid and do it anyway. I mean, you can show that you're full of fear, and you can do it anyway, yeah. and you can lead the United Nations, yeah. and you and go can, beyond the fear, and you can go beyond the fear. But not even beyond the fear to, to, to give the, the most amazing speech, you know, known to man. Mm. Just beyond the fear to be able to even stand up there and open your mouth and say what you yeah. need to say. And yeah. there's actually a really wonderful line that I think was a direct quote from her, which, of course, I'm not going to remember. <laughs> mm. uh, which is that. Oh, I'm not going to remember it. But it's, it's something to do with... Fit, Answers that, on that, a postcard, that, please. <laughs> that, that... Because she's giving advice to her lover, Hick, yeah. who's, who's coming to her for advice because she has to give a speech. And she basically says, you just... You, 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 you have to keep... You have to get up and do it and say it because what you have to say is more important than the fear. And so if you've got something to say that is more important than the fear, then no matter what is going on for you inside in terms of terror mm -hmm. and stage fright and you know that you've got a high-pitched voice and weak and that, you know, uh, 
But because she believed, that I, I believe, that because she believed that what she had to say was so important, and it was what she had to say. First of all, she was a brilliant writer, and she wrote most of what she said in public. Yes. Um, is she was transforming lives. Mm. The, the amount of work that she did that transformed people's lives, you know, people um, uh, from, you know, rough families, low-income families, you know, being the voice of the New Deal, of Franklin's New Deal, going out onto the streets and actually Usually be, enlightened person. Oh, my gosh, you know. And because I think she knew that what she was doing was showing the American people that they were... Uh, that they were protected, that they were heard, that there was a way out of the mess that the, the country was in, um, uh, and that even though she said, um, and ah, uh, and had this high pitched mm -hmm. voice, and she knew that she was judged for her looks and her voice, she knew that what she was doing was so important that she needed to do it anyway. Boy, could we do with her now. Oh, my God. I want to ask you before we go to the audience, we've got both of them, plenty of time perfect. for questions, both online and here in person with you lovely people. But just let me, while you prepare and while the mics uh, are, are starting to roam, I wanted to ask you, uh, the great Toni Morrison once said that there's, as an artist, as a writer, with each characterization, with each book, there's a little less of you left as an artist. <laughs> it kind of rubs that. away your essential nature. And I wonder uh, if, Given this great panoply already um, of characters you've played, we've, we've discussed seven of, of them. What's left? <laughs> is there anything left in the tank? <laughs> and if there is, what is the character? Who is the character that you'd love to play? I mean, as a, you know, I, I haven't, you know, I'm, I'm constantly playing uh, women who have their shit together. Mm -hmm. Or if they don't, they do enough of the time that they're holding, you know, there's a roof over their head and, you know. And I'm, I'm really, uh, I, I'm really interested in playing someone who is, is struggling quite a lot more, mm. than, you know, who is, is really having a hard time um, either making ends meet or is, an, you know, proper, I played a few alcoholics, but, and, uh, you know, properly uh, an addict or, you know, I hate to use this word, but this I do mean this, degenerate. <laughs> in, so, so, so if I understand you correctly, yeah. <laughs> what you want to do is play a serial killer who's really got her shit together. <laughs> Can't wait. <laughs> right, let's go for some questions. Um, stick your hand up. We've got some at the front right away, second row. Um, where are the mics? Oh, you could probably just yell it at this I point. Think, <laughs> I think so, but it's fairer, I think, to the people who oh, are yeah, watching sorry. online. Can you, can you come down? Um, If you've got a mic in your hand, start asking your question and save time. Down here. We'll get to you. Hello, Gillian. Um, are you able to address the rumours about you playing Sarah Paulson's wife, potentially? <laughs> I was literally after some of the I, you know after some of the posts about you know throwing my name in the hat on my behalf right um, I I I emailed one of my agents in the states and she said uh, she's a thirty something six foot tall <laughs> professional football player like she's like you know one of the best football players in the world and has about thirty pounds of muscle on me. Um, so no, no. I, I would say, I would say probably not. Okay, thank yep. you. Yep. I think we've got one right Stick down here up. in the front. Yeah, plenty down here. Sorry, thank you. Um, if you could be one of your characters for a day, if you could live as any one of them, who would it be and why? And I love you and I think you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, pr pr probably Stella Gibson. Ooh. I mean, I, I don't say Jean, but I kind of feel like I live a Jean's life. <laughs> <laughs> more and more so, the more embarrassing I get in the eyes of my sons. <laughs> uh, but it would probably be quite fun to play uh, uh, Stella for a day, just because she's so, she's so smart and, um, uh, and has such, I, I really like the way her brain works in the show. And also, 
I, I, I wish that I could be a detective, actually. I'd love to, but I'm too stupid <laughs> and too clumsy and don't take enough stuff in. I feel like I'm present, but on the other hand, I miss like three quarters of what is right in front of my eyes. And, and also nobody would buy, if I knocked on people's doors or I like showed up at a crime scene, people would be like, isn't that Julian Anderson? <laughs> <laughs> so it would be really nice to actually get to do it like for real yeah. because I'm Priscilla Gibson. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Do you still have a question? Okay. Hi. Um, Sorry, I know you're meant to be in control. In I won't. I'm not going to take control. Um, in my English class, we've been studying Great Expectations. So we watched a couple of versions of, um, of the book. Um, and I thought that your version was really interesting. I was just wondering, what do you think Miss Havisham is a symbol for in the novel? Oh, golly. <laughs> Gosh. A nation's exam passes depend on you. <laughs> no pressure. Um, I mean, she so so she, she's ba she's trapped. She's she's the embodiment of a woman who is trapped in an old-fashioned ideal of what uh, a woman's role is meant to be, and that was in part why I I chose to use a particular voice that I did too, because I felt like she was almost frozen in time as the 18-year-old that she would have been when she was at the altar. Um, and uh, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't, yeah? I think so, and yeah, I kind of study and disappointment, actually, yeah. you know, and how you can live a whole life, as it were, impacted by disappointment and what it does to you. Yeah. How it shapes her cruelty Yeah. in a way. Yeah. I mean, that was so evident in the way you played her because she wasn't just some mad person. She was a suffering person, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And just eaten away with, with resentment and sorrow and self-pity and um, none of those things attract her characteristics, but at the same time, kind of understandable and timeless mm -hmm. and, um, and particularly given the era that we're talking about, you know. So just cut and paste all that, you'll get an A. <laughs> yes, right there. And then we'll go further back. Hi, what's up? What's up? <laughs> uh, I just wanted to know how was it to work with Lily Rabe? Oh, to what, how it was to work, I mean, it was so great. Sorry, can we have that question again? Because I know some people wouldn't have how, how was it to work with Lily Rabe, who plays um, Eleanor Roosevelt's uh, lover, I will say, Hick? Um, and uh, uh, she was great. I mean, I, I've seen some of the episodes now, and and the scenes um, but between the two of them, at least in, in the early episodes, I've seen are really special. And I don't know what... I mean, I know what we were aiming for, and it seems like we might have, have achieved what we were aiming for, but I don't know why we're shocked, because they are... Um, that there's a different... There's a different quality that that Hick brings out in Eleanor, and um, uh, almost a girlishness and a softness and a and a giddiness, and um, and and yet Lily is so she's so still and she's so um, uh, she's a curious she's 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 very very unique. She's a wonderful a wonderful woman. I really enjoyed working with her she was a delight and um but i feel like it was because it was her it was because of how she listened how her hick listened to eleanor that it allowed this other aspect of eleanor to come out um yeah Fantastic. Let's take a couple of questions from online. We've got a huge response online from audience members all around the world. Okay. I'm just going to read out two for the purposes of Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Courtney joined via the Living Knowledge Network, and Courtney asks, when working with a new writer or producer, what's the most valuable information they can provide you with to help you get into character, and what do you prefer to figure out for yourself? Wow. And then there's another question. From Wait, one at a time. <laughs> Uh, is that all right if I did sure. one at a time? Okay, so so um, I, the, the experience that I had on The Crown, which was with 
what the, they set a precedent that I wish could, uh, you know, could be manifested all, all the time. But, you know, the, the care with which the actors or anybody, the crew, all of the crew working on that series is such that you just, you, you feel, everybody feels like they're valued and they're part of the whole. And also their research team is so exquisite and forensic. You could literally ask them for anything. I mean, I asked for some things for them to find some things that were down such rabbit holes of, you know, detail, video, blah, 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 blah. Um, and, and so when you've had that support, then not having that support, either because the producer doesn't know how to do that, it's not part of how a show is run, it's not, um, they don't, doesn't cross their mind, they don't have the funds, they don't, whatever. It really reminds you then how much of your career has been incredibly lonely and you've been on your own because most of the time you are kind of finding all that yourself and needing to, but the the, the luxury of having uh, producers that know, um, that know and really care for the actor's process is invaluable and incredibly rare. Um, with writers, um, it's... It, I re uh, it's I don't want to get into right I'm yeah I'm sorry it's a <laughs> it's really hard to find really well written scripts and uh, it just it is and and so I, I have started to realize that I compartmentalize and and um, I I have a tendency to to not necessarily care more and give more if I feel like the script is giving back. Mm. Because but that, that would be helps. natural, wouldn't it? It would, but it feels very petty. And um, well, you've got to struggle though if, if, if the I'm script that isn't kind of there. Person, but well, you've got to be a bit difficult. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but it is hard when you know that that it's like. But then it's down to me. It's like, well, why am I doing? What? Why? Why have I said yes? Yeah. Anyway, it's a big, it's a big, so I'll, I'll leave that there. <laughs> and another question, yeah. and it came from Damien Barr, who's also a fellow of the RSL. Hello, Damien. And, he, and this one's for Gillian and Andrew. Um, you can read one book again for the first time. Oh. Really relive a formative reading moment. Which book is it, and oh, which God. version of you is reading it? Oh, God. <laughs> Hmm. That's a cracking question. It we is. love Damien Barr, by the way. Hello, Damien. Um, do you want to go first? No. <laughs> I'll pick an obvious example because I think it is, uh, it is important to pick something that you read perhaps in childhood. Damien's question is very good. And for me, it is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird because, you know, I suddenly realised that not only was that the father that I wish I'd had, but also that was the enlightenment I wish we had every day, mm. was the understanding that, that, that a living work of literature, and by the way, the Royal Society of Literature, is the great organisation for keeping these questions alive and adding to them and refining them and leaning into genuine change. And for me, that book, I could see that if I, every time that book occurred to me all the way through my life, it would be a prism through which I could achieve a better understanding of who I was and where I was, what planet I was on, and what the morality was of that place, and what the complications were. It's, well, more complications today just in how it's been reframed. That's right. Um, and yeah. we live with great writing every day in that way, so I would, I would love to be reading that for the mm. first time tomorrow and starting all over again. Gosh. <laughs> um, oh, I'm really struggling. Uh, Mostly because some of my favourite books are so uh, are so dark, um, <laughs> and and I'm not sure I really want to be uh, in that place at this particular moment again. Although I do, you know, I mean, for instance, a little life. Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, I just I I could not believe how how good and. Uh, uh, profoundly devastating and richly drawn uh, those characters were and, mm -hmm. and I really 
uh, but I, I'm not sure whether I'd, I want to put myself in that, in that world at this particular moment. Um, um, I'm trying to think of books that I've read when I was a lot younger. I, I de didn't really discover reading, I think, until I was an adult, mm -hmm. not, not in, the, in a way that I wished that I had. So, but, but in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that answer. Just to, yeah. We've still got some time for more questions, so please fire your hands up. I feel <laughs> there's always this sense that we should be fair to the geography of the room, so let's go <laughs> to the middle. Yes. Hi. Um, if you could give one piece of advice to young performers, um, mm. what would it be? Sort of like, what would you maybe have said to your younger self? Um... Well, I, I think I have, a, I have a responsibility to change. I mean, I was asked at one point to write a letter to my younger self of advice, uh, uh, a letter that was then published. Um, and I... But it doesn't really relate to performance. And I guess in relation to performance, it's quite different because it's... So what, what I have learned, and th this is both for um, my, you know, in the olden days of aud auditioning, uh, and it still relates to um, performances as a professional actor, is that if, if you put everything you have into something, whether it's an audition, or whether it's in a play or whatever you're cast with, or whatever it is that you're doing, whether the performance is, is, is dance or whether you're a painter or whatever, if you know that at that particular time, in that moment, with the information that you have and the time that you have, and the, that if you put everything you know you have into it, then that can actually feel like that's enough that you know that you've given, you can't let yourself off the hook. You can't say, oh, well, I, you know, I didn't get it because there's two parts of this. There's the, there's the, the way that we can sometimes sabotage things by not really putting effort into it because that means if we don't get it, then we can just say to ourselves, oh, well, I didn't really try. It's actually the, doing the opposite, knowing that, that you did the absolute best that you could do and the fact that you didn't get it does not mean that the best that you could do is not good enough. It means that it purely was not meant for you. It was meant for somebody else. So then being able to then let go of what the consequence is, which is incredibly freeing, to be able to honestly say, look, I did, I showed up my 100 or 110 percent. And same with Thatcher. You know, I put everything into that. I felt like I did the best that I could do. At the end of the day, you know, I, I, I'm sure there are people out there who absolutely hated my portrayal of her, but the majority could have hated and gone, what the fuck was she doing? I mean, what with the, the head and the, you know? They could have, that could have been the majority. That could have been all the articles. That could have been, you know. And I needed to be in a place where I felt like, that's, this is what I've got. This is what I've got. Take it or leave it. And and really being able to, you know, cut to, if that had been the case, <laughs> I might not be sitting here. <laughs> I might have quit the business. But the idea is that actually, uh, you, you have to get to a place where you can let go and let go after auditions, yeah. you know, that, that, you know, just trusting that, you know, and the amount of times that after the effect, when I haven't gotten something that I was particularly attached to, when I realised that actually I'm so grateful, I'm so grateful I didn't, I didn't get that because dot 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 another door is opened or my mum needs me or well, you know whatever. Thank you. Yes, you've got it. Hi. So I was wondering whether your character interpretation of Blanche had been led by Tennessee Williams's sort of kind of ahead of its time style within it, yet it was pulled down by the societal aspects of the time? Uh, I think d definitely, yes. I mean, I think that 
my my interpretation, and I think probably led by Benedict, but certainly I, I came to this realization and understanding was that the 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 version of the the moth to the flame of Blanche uh, had as much strength and fire in her than uh, as it had vulnerability mm. and um, I'll use the word weakness, but I mean weakness just in terms of her being under the control of the alcohol, being under the control of her uh, relationship to men, being under the control of her self, her own demons, um, and and so I. I you mean also, in a sense that her fragility shouldn't be allowed to write her off. That she was somehow because she was fragile yeah, yes. and vulnerable. Yeah. That she that didn't mean yeah. she was a write-off or a mad person. Yeah. There was always that way of describing Blanche in early reviews, and even Williams has to be said sometimes allowed you to feel she was just a kind of crazy person. Yeah, a, a crazy person, and also that all of those, all of the life events and all of the the attributes that he writes equate to a woman who is on the outside so delicate and weak that she looks like she might blow over or break or you know I, yeah. I don't I feel like there was enough in his description of the fire in her belly mm -hmm. you know that that lended itself to uh, you know I mean imagine Imagine living that 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 the life that she lived before she she showed up on her sister's mm -hmm. uh, doorstep to be to to keep coming back, you know, to keep showing up after being kicked out of the town, mm -hmm. after you know selling yourself, mm -hmm. after being beaten up by by you know this liquid gold, and to walk into a whole lot of male brutality and be blamed for it. Yeah. You know, there's so much going on in that play, which you drew out. I mean, it's, but, I mean, that's a question really I would like to ask. Mm. Do you ever want to go back again to a character? I mean, it has been known performers go back to... I did, there was a potential opportunity for us to, to do it a third time. And I, I at that point, I, st I started that, uh, that route. And then I realised that actually... I feel like I escaped with my life. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there again. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm just trusting to you. There's so many hands up. Just let's get the mic to whoever occurs to you. Yeah. Yeah, let's get the, get the questions moving. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, terrific event. Really, really great. Uh, thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, um, Gillian, whether you had read... White Houses by Amy Bloom when you were preparing for the Eleanor Roosevelt series. No. No, that's a pity you, sh you should. Yeah, it's, well it's, it's about... It's based around the relationship of Eleanor and Hick and is, is really a wonderful read. So it's a pity, but... Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. He's, <laughs> he's still reading. Yeah, who's got the mic? I've, I've got it. Yeah, got go it. for it. I, I wondered, I, I started to ask you a question on the Galaxy Zoom and then the time cut out. Oh, and no. I wondered if you could finish oh, it now. No. Okay, okay. It is, and it is, it's about Macbeth. You, you've often said you wanted to play Lady mm. Macbeth. And I wondered, who would you choose? Which d dashing Scotsman, you know, would you choose to be your... <laughs> to, <laughs> apart from Andrew, would you choose to be your... Mac <laughs> to be Macbeth, can you think of a character? Well, you know, it's, I mean, I, I'm going to answer this in a very disappointing way, which is that I've since decided against it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Why? I... Mm. Too many portrayals in existence? No, I... I you know, I, I think after you've done, you know... Such full-bodied, constant, immersed characters as a Blanche and a Thatcher and etc. etc. Uh, 
I, I almost feel like I've, like, like Lady Macbeth is, I know, it's terrible, but it feels too easy. You know, it's, um, it, it, in the same way that I almost feel like Hedda Gabler is. It you mean too like, obvious? Too in obvious, that sense. To, yeah. yeah, yes. And yeah. I, I did a Lady Macbeth as an audition when I, uh, when I was in my late twenties, I think, and uh, and it was that that got me interested. But it was the same time that in the work that I put into it, and I, I, I don't know, I just, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure if I would find it if I would find it satisfying enough. And I might be proved wrong. You know, I think it's a, I think it's an interesting piece of self knowledge that, if I could venture, because mm. I mean Francis McDormand I think did a brilliant job recently um, on screen, but I think that it's a piece of self knowledge to know that something's just slightly too predictable for you. Mm. So in a sense, it's like something being overwritten. There isn't enough room for you because people have already imagined you in roles like that, I've seen you in roles like that, perhaps. Yeah, and, and it also feels like I've 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 explored so much of it. It doesn't feel like it's something that I haven't explored yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is part of why I say yes to things. Um, well, you make good choices on that basis. You go with your gut, which must tell you, no, no, that's not going to be as exciting as it seems on paper. Mm. I, I kind of got to that. When I was at the point of, am I going to give away months of my life to this? Yeah. I kind of made the decision not to. And I might come to. back to it, but... Uh, yeah. Who's got it? Yep. Uh, Jillian, thank you so much for a lovely uh, evening. Um, I, I'm curious about one particular aspect as a Canadian now, now living over here. I'm, I'm keen to question you about your accent this evening. Mm. Uh, um, when, what feels natural to you now that you're living over here and, and what, when do you have to put it on? When do you turn it up, turn the dial up when mm. you turn it back down? What, what, how do you approach an audience coming into an audience like this, what what feels? I mean, right? I don't. I mean, usually it's about what's in my ear simultaneously because that's how it. Um, uh, I mean, I just got back from the states, and and while I was in the states, the other half of my accent was part of how I was communicating, and it it is. Um, if I was five minutes on the phone with somebody from the states right now after doing this interview, I would I would fall into. Uh, an American accent and it's something that at, ver at various times I've tried to control it I've thought oh, this is freaking people out too much it's it's I need to you know and when I've tried to control it um, it just sounds I feel like I, I, I sound I sound like an idiot. I sound, you know, I sound, I'm trying not to speak with a British accent. I'm trying to speak with an American accent. I'm trying, you know, and it feels very uh, it feels false, and what feels most natural to me, having grown up in both places, well, predominantly in my formative years, having grown up in the UK, uh, it, 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 this feels the most natural when I'm here, and American feels the most natural when I'm there. Mm. And it's kind of as, as simple as that. Okay. Hi. Can I ask you a question? Uh, because I have a microphone, I have priority. Sorry. I can't see where you are. <laughs> I'm here. So artificial intelligence. Sorry, where, where, where are you? I'm here. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, sorry. So artificial intelligence is entering all kinds of arts, and uh, there are computer games. There is ag augmented uh, cinema that Cameron is doing. So what do you think? Uh, what is the future of cinema? There will be no actors at all. It will be all computer generated or not. And you personally, would you buy AI generated art? Uh, uh. Let's take the to last question. The first question. Yeah, I think we just take the last question. The last question. Would, yeah. would, would you I buy AI-generated art? AI-generated art, so not NFTs, actually AI-generated art. Um, <laughs> why are you laughing? <laughs> um, I've never thought about that. I didn't know that AI is generated art. I mean, if, if I liked it and I could afford it, maybe? I mean, I don't know. Was there another part of that question that you wanted to address? The earlier bit? No. No. Got it. Okay, let's go. Um, 
um, I just read uh, White Bird with my son because he had to read it for class. And I White thought, Bird. White, White Bird. Bird. White Bird. Yeah. Like that film. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And um, I thought it was beautiful. Mm. And I just wanted to know they haven't really said too much about the movie adaptation that you've done. Mm. Can you tell us anything about the filming or the character or anything like that or how you prepared for it? Um, uh, directed by Mark Forrester. And, um, and I shot it in Prague at the beginning of this year. And it also has uh, Helen Mirren, um, who is the, yeah, the grandmother. Um, it started as a, um, uh, what do you call that? A, uh, graphic novel. What do you say? Graphic novel. Exactly. It started as a graphic, <laughs> it started as, uh, it started as a graphic novel and it's uh, the story of a young boy in, uh, German occupied France during World War II. The young man has um, has polio and he's on crutches, and he lives with his parents still. And he's he's in school. I think he's fourteen. He starts out as fourteen, and uh, I play his mother. And um, he ends up helping a uh, a fellow classmate, a young girl, to hide. When the um, when the Germans come to take the Jews away from his classroom, and so he helps to hide her, and sh he hides her in uh, the barn outside their uh, their house, and um, for over two years, and they develop a very strong, beautiful friendship and relationship, and probably shouldn't tell you the end, but anyway, it's, uh, it's, um, it, was, it was directed by Mark Forrester. I've seen it. It's really beautiful. The, the kids in it, the young girl and the boy, uh, they are at riveting. And um, I know they're trying to take it to festivals first before it comes out. So um, it's very sweet. Time for two more questions. Um, where are the mics? It's right here at the back. Yeah, go for it. Just get them into the hands of people with their hands yeah. up, please. Yeah. Hi, hi, Gillian, uh, at the back. Hi. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm just wondering if you've ever returned to the Merchant Hotel in Belfast, which you helped make famous, and if you keep in touch with Jamie Dornan. <laughs> Where is the Merchant Hotel in Belfast? Um, it's, where, it's where they filmed. What? That you did a lot of filming there with the Oh, film. did we? The Merchant <laughs> We filmed at the Marriott or the Hilton or something because that's where the pool was that Stella. Okay. Well, maybe no. I don't remember. Um, no. <laughs> uh, yeah. Every, every once in a while, uh, Jamie and I uh, communicate or have a meal together. Yeah. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Thank you that, very much. That, that really worked. That chemistry, and it's one of the mysteries of mm. you know contemporary British television. Just how I mean, on paper, that must have sounded mad. You know, a very bright um, investigator has a strange relationship with a killer, mm. but it doesn't seem... Oh, but that's not, that's not unusual, though. Uh, that having become, since then, uh, a crime aficionado, <laughs> and, uh, uh, that's actually really not... Their, not... their minds are in sympathy yeah, somehow. Yeah, that, that in order to truly understand the serial killer, for instance, the investigator g goes as far as, you know goes properly into their, their mind and their thinking and sometimes even kind of loses the plot. Brilliant. Okay, one last question. Ooh. Hi, Jillian. I'm here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I might have misunderstood you earlier, but I thought I heard you say that when you choose to accept a role, you feel that it's either in you or it's not. And I guess you come across as really kind of cool, calm, and collected. And hearing you talk about um, Eleanor Roosevelt and how she's kind of, you know, afraid to, or not afraid, but you know, there's kind of that fear there. Mm. I was wondering if you kind of related to that at any stage in your career where you kind of like going back to what you're saying about string theory, not string mm. theory, but you know, about whether it's in you or not. Like, yeah, did you ever feel kind of that way maybe earlier on or even in the present? I still very often feel that way. And I think what, 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 uh, so, so feeling that level of fear that it could potentially, um, unsettle or unseat me and performance etc and I, I uh, that that's still very alive and well in my in my life and I think why I was 
interested in that with Eleanor is that the way that I, as you said, you seem calm and collected. So that's that that's a an an outside persona that I know that I can put on a certain percentage of the time, even though underneath I might, or even, you know, physically, my hand might be doing, you know, whether I'm doing like a, um, a Letters Live thing at Royal Albert Hall or something like that, where I'm in front of a large crowd and I'm in a lot of fear. Um, uh, what I was fascinated about with Eleanor is the fact that she showed it. She allowed herself not even that she allowed herself she I think she knew that that's how she came across and she knew but she knew that what she had to say was so much more important than the fact that she but also what she did is she she had an audience back then there was something about her personality and her magnetism and the way that she or maybe it was the time because I've watched a lot of interviews but but I, th I think actually that, that that part of it is a little bit of of you know of elitism and that because she was a Roosevelt and certainly because she was then married to a president, she, people didn't interrupt her. Men didn't interrupt her. So you ha you see these interviews where a journalist who is ninety percent male at that time is asking her questions and she's taking her time to answer. And there are a lot of spaces between her words and her, and he's not interrupting. They're not interrupting. And it's kind of shocking. It's like, wait, that doesn't happen anymore. That, well, I mean, she's not being, but I think it was because they, they wouldn't dare in society. I don't think they would have dared to interrupt Eleanor Roosevelt, even though she's taking a really long time to explain <laughs> this or to talk about this particular thing. Um, and and so, I don't know what exactly my point is. <laughs> I think that I answered your question. Definitely. Yeah. Ladies and Thank gentlemen, you. It's come to broadening that. the field and indeed the meaning of literature is a core value of the Royal Society of Literature. It's a unique organization. Give your beautiful minds a friend for life by joining the organization. Jillian and I agreed to do this event tonight because we admire it as an organisation. We, we lean into the work that it's doing. And we're so grateful to you for coming along tonight, for your enthusiasm, for your help and your fact-checking, and for your general enthusiasm. <laughs> it's been a real thrill for me personally. And I want you to put your hands together and thank my friend, Gillian Anderson. <laughs>
to, to everyone joining us in this room and from your rooms at home. We're looking forward to seeing you again uh, very soon and hope you've enjoyed this evening as much as I have. Uh, please join me in giving a final round of applause to our speakers this evening, Gillian Anderson and Andrea Hogan. <laughs>